Well, we are well into Stephen's speech of Acts chapter 7, which will end in his death by stoning. Now, his speech is essentially a recounting of Israel's record of unfaithfulness towards God and being stubbornly resentful towards God's prophets, beginning even with the patriarchs. And his words are not meant to defend himself, something that his accusers were expecting. They were actually meant to turn the tables to accuse his accusers. The discourse is also meant to remind the members of the Sanhedrin, as well as these angry men of the synagogue of the freedmen, who were the ones who dragged Stephen uh, to the Jewish high court and claimed that he had blasphemed both God and Moses, is it that the history of the Hebrews, he reminds them, is all about their rejection of God's prophets, who bring messages of warning and chastisement from the Lord, and then their bewilderment when they are oppressed by foreigners and exiled away from the promised land. And during his speech, Steve, Stephen draws intentional parallels between Joseph, Moses, David, and Yeshua. And this infuriates all who were present even more. But in reality, Stephen, Stephen, I'm afraid, was doomed nearly from the beginning of his acceptance of Christ because of his background and in his nature. Stephen was an outspoken, bold, and fearless man who today we'd probably label as a fanatic. He was also a Hellenist Jew, which meant that his first language was Greek. And while this is the norm outside of Judea, in Jerusalem it was frowned upon by the Holy Land Jews, even though Greek was heard everywhere throughout the Holy City. It seems all but certain that he was also a Samaritan, a people group that were despised and rejected by the mainstream Jewish community. Now, as a believer in Yeshua's Messiah, he was part of a small minority faction within Judaism, one whose reason for existing, worshiping this deceased carpenter's son from Nazareth as their Jewish Messiah, this was not accepted as legitimate by the rest of Judaism. Stephen was a pariah to, to Jews, to Judaism, to the temple, and to the synagogue. And he seemed to have gone out of his way to speak his mind to anyone who would listen. He was about to pay the ultimate price for his uncompromising stance on Yeshua. So let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 35. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, this will be page 1369. Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 35. This Moshe, Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge, is the very one whom God sent as both ruler and ransomer by means of the angel that appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing miracles and signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. This is the man who was in the assembly in the wilderness, accompanied by the angel that had spoken to him at Mount Sinai, and by our fathers, the man who was given living words to pass on to us. But our fathers didn't want to obey him. On the contrary, they rejected him. They turned their hearts to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us some gods to lead us, because this Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. That was when they made an idol in the shape of a calf, and they offered a sacrifice to it, and they held a celebration in honor of what, what they'd made with their own hands. So God turned away from them and gave them over to worship the stars, has been written in, as has been written in the book of the prophets. People of Israel, it wasn't me 
that you offered salt slaughtered animals and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness. No, you carried the tent of Molech, the star of your god, Rephan, the idols you made so that you could worship them. Therefore, I'll send you into exile beyond Babel, beyond Babel. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness. It had been made just as God who spoke to Moses had ordered it made, according to the pattern Moses had seen. Later on, our fathers who had received it brought it in with Yehoshua, Joshua, so that uh, when they took the land away from the nations that God drove out from before them. So it was until the days of David. He enjoyed God's favor. He asked if he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, and Solomon did build him a house. But Ha'elion he doesn't live in places made by hand. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, says Adonai. The earth is my footstool. What kind of a house could you build for me? What kind of a place could you devise for my rest? Didn't I myself make all these things? Stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you continually oppose the Ruach HaKodesh. You do the same things your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who told in advance about the coming of the Tzaddik, the righteous one. Now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You who received the Torah as having been delivered by angels, but you don't keep it. And on hearing these things, they were cut to their hearts. They ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw God's Shekinah, his glory. And with Yeshua standing at the right hand of God, look, he exclaimed, I see heaven opened. The Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this they began yelling at the top of their voices so that they wouldn't have to hear him. And with one accord they rushed at him and threw him outside the city and they began stoning him. The witnesses laid down their coats at the feet of a young man named Shaul. And as they were stoning him, Stephen called out to God, Lord Yeshua, receive my spirit. Then he kneeled down and he shouted out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And with that he died. Now remembering that the reason for Stephen's trial is that he supposedly blasphemed Moses, Stephen reminds his accusers <laughs> that their forefathers as captives in Egypt did not want to obey Moses even after all the miracles and the signs he performed there. In fact, a few weeks after their escape from Egypt and their tyrannical, uh, tyrannical pharaoh, many of the Hebrews began turning their hearts back towards Egypt. Stephen refutes the charge against him of being opposed to Moses by declaring that Moses was ruler and ransomer of Israel. Of course, Unless Stephen was naive, he full well knew that the charge against him was not that he, he was actually against Moses the man. It was that Stephen questioned the traditions of the elders. The oral Torah of, that the synagogue insisted is what Moses taught. In Christian terms, Stephen challenged the local church doctrine. Now Stephen makes a comment in verse 37 that quotes Deuteronomy 18.15. Obviously making the point that Stephen's master, Yeshua, that's the one that's being referenced. Let's read the entire passage in Deuteronomy to understand Stephen's point. It's in Deuteronomy 18, <clears throat> verses 15 through 19. I'll read it for you. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. Adonai will raise up a, uh, for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from among your own kinsmen. You are to pay attention to him. Just as when you were assembled at Horeb and requested Adonai your God, don't let me hear the voice of Adonai my God anymore or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I'll die. On that occasion, Adam, Adonai said to me, they're right in what they're saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, he will have to count to, for himself to me. Now first, 
Stephen is saying that this is a messianic prophecy of Moses. Yeshua once said this about Moses in John chapter 5. He says, don't think that it is I who will be your accuser before the Father. Do you not know who will accuse you? Moses, the very one you've counted on. For if you really believed Moses, you'd believe me. Because it was about me that he wrote. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Yeshua, in that statement, is referring to what Stephen just quoted about the prophet. Second, Stephen is saying that Israel should be expecting this new prophet and understand that he is going to be in the mold of Moses more than in the mold of King David. And in the mold of King David is what Judaism generally expected and it continues to expect that the Messiah will be. Third is that this prophet Moses speaks of will be one of their kinsmen. He's going to be a Hebrew. And finally, since God will raise up this prophet like Moses, and God will put his own words into this prophet's mouth, as with Moses, then those who refuse to heed him are directly disobeying God, and he will be held personally liable to God for their sin. So Stephen says that the people rejected their deliverer, Moses. And even more, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, to receive God's word, they grew impatient for his return. And so during his absence, they began, began devising other ways to satisfy their longings, their desires. The Israelites began worshiping other gods, specifically making a calf god. They offered a sacrifice to it, and they were holding a celebration over it, over something they had made with their own hands. The result... God turned away from them. Let's pause for a second. <clears throat> Let's face something that no one in the modern institutional church wants to hear, but sadly it's so. This description of what the Israelites did while waiting for Moses to return is precisely what's happening to many Christians as we wait for Yeshua's return. Precisely. Moses came because God sent him. And Moses redeemed God's people. Christ came because God sent him. And Christ redeemed God's people. Moses ascended to the top of Mount Sinai and there to be with God to receive God's word directly from God. Christ ascended to the true dwelling place of God, heaven to receive God's word directly from God his Father. Moses and Messiah Yeshua both promised they will return. But after a time of being with the Father. But the people of Israel, see, they grew restless. They grew tired of waiting. They decided Moses perhaps wasn't even going to return or had been indefinitely delayed. They wanted answers. They wanted solutions right now. They began to doubt Moses. So they slipped back into their old ways. They determined that their intellect, their ability to craft their own solutions with their own hands, that's the right way to go. They found a willing religious leader to go along with them in Moses' own brother, Aaron. The result was they worshipped a God who was not their God. Matter of fact, it wasn't even real. Even though they were confident they were worshipping their God. Christianity, during the 2,000 years Christ has begun, has grown impatient. God's word's grown old and tired among many followers. And so Christians by the millions have slipped back into their old ways, no longer trusting God's mediator, Yeshua. And by association, also not his word, the Bible. 
Instead, some of our religious leaders have used their own intellects, their own agendas to fashion new doctrines, new ways made with their own minds and hands that are pleasing to their followers. Slowly, these doctrines have caused the Bible to be whittled down from its original. Early on, the Old Testament was severed away by the Roman church as irrelevant to Christians. Today, many denominational leaders warn that merely reading the Old Testament has become dangerous to our faith. If you can imagine it. Thus, it's common practice in our time that a Bible contains no, new, no Old Testament, especially for new believers, only the new. Inevitably, the New Testament has also been whittled down with the argument that really all that matters is our salvation in Christ. Anything, everything beyond that secondary or it's optional. How we live our lives after salvation just isn't that important. Only that our ticket to heaven has been validated. That's what matters. On this earth, our only real duty is to love in whatever way we choose to define love. So mostly, only the Gospels matter, along with perhaps a few select passages from Paul's writings. Thus, a Bible that consists only of the Gospels is now common, and it's often handed out to new prospects by evangelists. I mean, imagine the message that that sends to those who are seeking God. The result is, too many Christians now worship a God and a Savior that bears little resemblance to the God and the Savior of the Scriptures. You know, long ago, I taught you that there is only two ways for us to know God. His name and His characteristics. When believers no longer care or care to know God's characteristics, beyond love and mercy, and don't think we have any obligation to learn his word or to obey his commandments, we are worshiping a God that is a product of our intellects. And that is just as false as the calf God that was fashioned by human hands out in the wilderness. That a substantial group of Israelites bought into that man-made calf God was proof to themselves that it must be right and true that many, perhaps a majority, I don't know, perhaps, of Christians have bought into the newer man-made definitions of God, of Messiah, of His Word, means to believers, well, it must be right and true. Everybody I know is doing it. God used the smallest and the least prominent of the tribes of Israel, the Levites, to rid Israel of the calf worshippers' leadership and to restore truth. God is in process today of raising up the smallest group of believers who long to learn His Word, to rediscover God's written truth, to reinstitute God-ordained appointed times and worship practices, to obey His commandments, the history of the Israelites perfectly parallels the history of Christianity. If you think this isn't the case, then consider the next scriptural quote by Stephen, which is taken from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 25, 6, and 7. And by the way, if you were to compare this quote by Stephen as it's presented to us in the book of Acts, to what's found in Amos, in the complete Jewish Bible, you're going to find distinct differences. Because the complete Jewish Bible is based on the Masoretic Hebrew Bible. The quote we find coming from Stephen's mouth in this passage in Acts is taken from the Greek Septuagint. This once again points up how the synagogue differed from the temple. And the vast majority of the synagogues were Hellenist. Greek-oriented. Now, so that we can all follow along, I'm going to requote exactly what Stephen is recorded to have said in Acts chapter 7, 42 and 43. 
So God turned away from them and gave them over to their gave them over to worship the stars, as has been in, written in the book of the prophets. People of Israel, it wasn't to me that you offered slaughtered animals and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness. No, you carried the tent of Moloch and the star of your, your god, Rephan, the idols you made so that you could worship them. Therefore, I'm going to send you into exile beyond Babel. This is what the prophet Amos told the Israelites was their history and their condition. To say that Amos's listeners didn't much like what they heard is a monumental understatement. Thus, few believed what God's prophet Amos said about Israel and to Israel. Why didn't they accept it? Because their answer was something like, when did we gather together to worship in the place of Molech? When did we worship the god Rephan? That is, Israel didn't feel they were worshiping other gods. They sincerely believed they were worshiping their god, Jehovah. But in fact, the god they worshiped was the god they imagined. Therefore, Jehovah sent them away from him. He warned them. They wouldn't listen to him. The same thing's happening today in Christian places of worship all around our globe. Thankfully, not all, of course. So the question for believers is this, and I want you to consider this carefully. Will you react as the crowd did when Peter stood before them and indicted them for believing false doctrines of men and rejecting the true word of God, whereby they repented? They wanted to know. They said, how can we change? Or... Will you react as do the Sanhedrin and the synagogue members when Stephen indicted them? They hardened their hearts and their minds and they demanded that yet another of God's prophets, Stephen, who brought this word of God to them, be killed. Starting in verse 44, Stephen's address shifts to the matter now of the temple. This was yet another accusation from the synagogue. That is, that Stephen was supposedly speaking against the temple, claiming that Yeshua was going to destroy it. And the narrative of the temple moves us now into the time of King David, yet another messianic figure, well recognized by all Jews. The saga begins with the wilderness Tabernacle, a tent, and God ordered Moses to have this tent made exactly after a pattern that Moses was shown. And after Moses was replaced by Joshua, Joshua had that tent brought into the land and placed it Shiloh, Shiloh. It remained there until King David, not for the entire time as it was moved to Nob, immediately leading up to, uh, leading up to David. And Stephen says that David sought God's permission to build a temple a dwelling place for the Lord, but that his son Solomon was the one who wound up actually building it. Stephen again points up something that the Jews did not want to hear. God didn't ask for a temple. He didn't seek a temple for himself and only essentially showed mercy to David by allowing David's son to build a temple because David so badly wanted to. In verse 48, Stephen once again brings up the issue of man-made things being used to worship God. Stephen says that God does not live in places made by human hands. Oh my, that is not what the Sadducees and the temple authorities believed. And neither did those from this synagogue. Never mind that Stephen goes on to quote the truth of Holy Scripture from Isaiah 66. Verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne, says Adonai. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house could you build for me? What sort of place could you devise for my rest? Didn't I myself make all these things? God well knows the way humans are wired. You know, if you erect a temple or a shrine, it will often become more important than the one in whose honor it was built. That's just the way we are. We love to build grand religious edifices because they make us proud. We seriously think 
we're doing something for God when we construct monumental show places and then call them holy sanctuaries. How often I've heard pastors and elders at church building meetings speak about the need to spend big, make things especially beautiful because we want to give God our best. But the best God wants from his worshipers is the best of the fruits of the spiritual gifts that he's given to us to the benefit of others, to the benefit of God's kingdom. Not the best, most lavish buildings that money can buy. So often, I believe, we unconsciously think that God is more present in a church or a synagogue building than he is anywhere else. And the more grand the building is, the more present he is. But as is pointed out again and again in Holy Scripture, nothing made with human hands is perfect enough for God to entice him to dwell there. And neither can humans ever build a structure that contains him. Even when it comes to sacrificial altars, God doesn't want anything fancy. Because humans not only cannot perfect that which God has already created, all we can actually do is to defile what he's already made when we try to modify it and make it better according to our standards. Very early on in God's Torah commandments, he speaks of this principle in Deuteronomy 20, verses 21 and 22. He says, for me, you need make only an altar of earth. On it you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, peace offerings, sheep, goats, and cattle. In every place I, where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. If you do make me an altar of stone, you're not to build it of cut stones. For if you use a tool on it, you just profane it. The stones as found lying around on the ground were more preferable to the Lord than cutting, polishing, ornamenting, fitting them together to make a beautiful altar. Why? Because God's creation is perfect just the way it is. Our attempts to enhance these things and then use them to supposedly honor God are in vain. So Stephen's point is that the temple building is held in much too high of regard. Much. It's not something that God even wanted in the first place. It's merely something that he allowed for the sake of King David and for Solomon and for Israel. But his allowing it also came with cautionary warnings, as we just read in Exodus. Nonetheless, Solomon built a temple so grand, so lavish and expensive, that foreigners came to Jerusalem just to view it. And by the way, who do you suppose got praise for that temple? Solomon, which is exactly what he hoped for. So the temple had taken up a life all its own. The building was what mattered to the priesthood, the Sadducees, to most Jews. It was a national symbol. It was a point of national pride. What went on in that building, well, that was secondary. In fact, you know, we need to remember that the only place in the temple that God's presence ever showed up was above the Ark of the Covenant. Well... Ever since the destruction of the temple and their exile to Babylon, the ark had gone missing. When Nehemiah and Ezra, Ezra rebuilt a new temple, there was no ark of the covenant in that holy of holies. It remained empty right up through the time of Christ and until the temple's prophesied destruction now by the Romans in 70 AD. That's right. The temple had not held the Ark of the Covenant, and presumably God's presence hadn't been there since the Babylonian exile and their subsequent return. So Stephen is telling them that magnificent temple wasn't God's idea. It was a human idea. 
But King David didn't care. He wanted a temple for his God, just like all the other kings had temples for their gods. And then as Stephen's speech builds to a crescendo, man, he lets them have it with both barrels. He says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you oppose the Holy Spirit. You do the same things your wicked fathers did. But as bold and offensive as all that was, Stephen then goes all in. He says, you know, your fathers killed those who told in advance about the coming of the righteous one, the Sadiq, meaning the Messiah. <laughs> Guess what? You were the ones who actually murdered that prophesied righteous one when he arrived. Oh, man. Yet, he says, you claim to be the ones who received the Torah, but you don't keep it. Stephen's life was over. He had bashed the synagogue and the temple authorities, and they weren't about to take this humiliation lying down. Most of what Stephen said doesn't really need much explanation. However, notice he says that you claim to be the ones who received the Torah. Well, now obviously, it was Moses who received the Torah 1,300 years earlier. Not these people he was talking to. No, as we've discussed, Stephen was using standard synagogue synagogue language and thought processes of the day when he uses the word Torah. The religious leaders, rabbis, of the synagogues were said to be receiving the Torah. But what they and Stephen were referring to was oral Torah, traditions of the elders which they saw as divine and on par with the original Torah of Moses given at Mount Sinai. Stephen's words demonstrate the lack of distinction in the minds of the Jews in that day between man-made doctrines and the God-made Torah of Moses, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. We have precisely that same condition today among so many believers in Christianity and much of, the mess much of Messianic Judaism. You know, it can be really difficult to untangle long-held and cherished doctrines and customs and traditions from the actual Word of God. It's very hard. And attempting to do so and speaking out about it often brings great danger and uh, 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 anger, dissension. You know, that's why there weren't very many prophets of God that we hear about in the Bible. It's also why their lives were rarely pleasant Humans of all ages and eras want to hear what we want to believe. We want to believe what makes us comfortable. That's what we want to believe. Only sometimes are God's believers on an actual search for the truth. Most of the time we search to find a leader or a congregation that will validate what we've predetermined we want to believe. Starting at verse 54, we see Stephen's demise. Well, the grinding or gnashing of teeth that we read about here is a biblical idiom. It speaks of a deep upset or anxiety or frustration. And we're told that this is the emotional condition of, of those who heard Stephen's speech. They couldn't stand to hear one more word of it. With Stephen now knowing for certain he had but minutes to live, the Lord gives Stephen a peace that passes understanding. And God does this by filling Stephen with his spirit such that Stephen's face radiates. And he's given a glimpse into heaven, whereby he sees Christ standing at the right hand of God. Now, while Stephen's statement is reminiscent of Psalm 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, 13, it doesn't precisely mirror either one of them. But it's clear to me that Stephen's purpose is not necessarily to quote Scripture, but rather to describe what he saw as the fulfillment of those two Scripture passages. And since Son of Man was a well-known epithet that Yeshua liked to call himself, there was no further room for doubt among all those present. 
Stephen was claiming that Yeshua was in heaven with God. No segment of Judaism at this time, other than for Yeshua's followers, believed that a human being, including Jews, even in spirit, could ascend to heaven and be in God's presence. This went against all Jewish doctrines. This was the final straw. All restraint vanished. Verses 57 and 58 briefly describe the stoning of Stephen. Now, since stoning has proved to be the standard form of execution used among the Hebrews all during the biblical period, let's explore it a little bit to understand it better. <clears throat> the Old Testament gives us 18 cases in which capital punishment is called for. And among these are for immoral sexual behaviors, blasphemy, incest, profaning the Shabbat, murder and idolatry. And when we read that Stephen was rushed outside the city to be stoned, it reflects the laws about stoning and executions in general. In the Mishnah, section Sanhedrin, part 6, we find the detailed information about stoning. Now, while the Mishnah was admittedly not created until around 170 years after Stephen's stoning, there is ample evidence to suggest that these rules I'm about to tell you about applied during the New Testament era. Now, I'm going to quote just a few parts of this Mishnah so that we, we learn how this stoning procedure took place. When sentence of stoning has been passed, they take him forth to stone him. The place of stoning was outside, far away from the court, as it is written, bring Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp. That's Leviticus 24, 14. One man stands at the court, which is the Sanhedrin, with a towel in his hand. Another is mounted on a horse, near enough to see him. If one in the court says, I have somewhat to argue in favor of his acquittal, that man waves a towel, the horse runs and stops him from being stoned. The place of stoning was twice the height of a man. One of the witnesses knocked him down. If he died, that sufficed. If not, a second witness took a stone and dropped it on his heart. If he died, that sufficed. If not, he was stoned by all Israel. For it is written, the hand of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death, and then afterward, the hand of all the people of Israel. That's from Deuteronomy 17.7. So, the idea is that the that the first um, that at first the condemned person is to stand on an elevated place, or it could be the top of a pit, like we see here in this picture. Then he's pushed off that place by a witness, such that hopefully he lands on his head and dies. If he's only injured. And not dead, a second witness must take a large heavy stone and throw it down on his chest. With the idea it would break some ribs and make him unable to breathe. If that doesn't do the trick, then everyone else in attendance of the stoning must cast stones at him until he dies. Pretty brutal. Witnesses are those who make the accusations at the trial. They give testimony against the accused. In our case, we are directly told that the witnesses were what? False. They were liars. Thus, by causing the unjust death of an innocent person, the law was that false witnesses were now themselves murderers themselves subject to capital punishment, which included permanent separation from God. Our verse says that the crowd rushed Stephen outside the city. This complied with Torah law that neither execution or burial could occur inside the camp. In our case, this means the city limits of Jerusalem because death causes ritual impurity. So we have here a good, authentic account of stoning accomplished according to the law. But here we are also first introduced to Shaul, Paul. 
but with only a slight mention. Most Bible verses say that the witnesses, the executioners, laid down their coats at Paul's feet. Now, it's hard to be certain, but it appears that Paul is playing some kind of an official role at this execution, uh, maybe an officer for the Sanhedrin. He wasn't merely a random or a convenient person to, to hold and guard the outer garments of those who were doing the stoning. In Acts 22:19, 19, uh, rather 22 verses 19 and 20, Paul admits his willing participation in this event. Now let's be clear. Some Bible commentators try to make this an illegal execution. This is not true. We are told specifically in Acts 6.15 that everyone in the Sanhedrin was present as they saw this glow in Stephen's face as he made his case. So while perhaps not every I was dot or T was crossed from a, from a technical legal standpoint, this execution was legal. And it was fully sanctioned by the Jewish high court with the high priest Caiaphas uh, officiating. It wasn't a citizen's lynching. Chapter 7 concludes with Stephen shouting almost the same words as Christ did as he was nearing death. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But before that, he commends his spirit to Yeshua as the rocks pelted him, knocking him into unconsciousness. Now, we're, not told, we're told not that he died. Rather, he fell asleep. While saying fell asleep to describe one's death is not unusual in the Bible, it is always used in the death of a righteous person. Now, it's my personal conviction that the reason fell asleep is used instead of died is a view of to the possibility of a resurrection. I want to close with this wonderful hope that is available for all who trust in Messiah Yeshua. It's taken from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. Just don't turn there, just listen to this. Look, I'll tell you a secret. Not all of us will sleep, but we will all be changed. It'll take but a moment, the bleak of an eye at the final shofar. For the shofar will sound, the dead will be raised to live forever, and we too will be changed. For this material which can decay must be clothed with imperishability. This which is mortal must be clothed with immorality. Uh, immortality, I'm sorry. Immortality. When what decays puts on imperishability and what is mortal puts on immortality, then this passage in the Tanakh will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Sin draws its power from the Torah. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. So my dear brothers, stand firm, immovable, always doing the Lord's work as vigorously as you can, knowing that united with the Lord, your efforts are not in vain. You see, death is final for the unsaved. But death more resembles a peaceful sleeping for the redeemed in Messiah. Death is its own end for the non-believer. Sleeping is temporary with an awakening when it's over. Stephen indeed merely went to sleep. We'll begin chapter 8 next time. Mm -hmm.